Good evening to everyone. Once again, uh, it's my honor to be your speaker, and I thank the congregation for having the trust and the faith in me to uh, to come out here and to deliver this series of lessons. And uh, tonight we're going to talk about a topic that I think uh, it hits home to a lot of us. You know, when someone does you wrong, it's a natural emotion to return the wrong. When somebody does something bad to you, you kind of want to do something bad back to them. It's it's a natural feeling. And did you know when we fail to repay good for evil that we're in disobedience to God? The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 through 17. That's where we're going to take our reading from for our introduction tonight. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, the Bible says this. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him speak peace or seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed, and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and with fear. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it's better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So many things in the scriptures feel as though we, we have some control over. Yet this one elusive discipline is something I know I've struggled with most of my life. Uh, I grew up in a home where my dad taught me when those bullies back you into a corner, you pick the bigger one and you pop them in the mouth <laughs> and they'll leave you alone. They'll stop asking you or demanding your lunch money. And it's always been bred into me that, you know, when somebody is picking at you or picking on you, that there is some uh, justice in uh, trying to seek your own. But that's not a biblical concept. That's not something that I think as Christians we should espouse. We don't talk about this very often because I don't think we like to think about it very often. We don't like the idea of uh, not being able to seek out our own vengeance when somebody does us wrong. Truth be told, to fail in this area, though, it is sin. It's short of what God expects of us. And this evening we're going to address three categories on the subject of vengeance. Vengeance is mine, says God, and we understand that. We know it's his, it belongs to him, but so often we want to seek it out for ourselves. And the law provided an earthly plan for justice to be meted to some degree. But the new law that Christ brought was intended to show man how justice is supposed to be replaced with mercy. My mind instantly goes to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, uh, when uh, the comparison is being made to Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. Uh, do you remember what was said uh, by the author there at that time? That the blood of Abel spoke one thing, but the blood of Christ spoke better things. And what does that suggest to us today? What did the blood of Abel cry out from the, from the ground when Cain rose up and killed him? It cried out vengeance. It cried out, uh, uh, take care of my brother for me. He did this to me. Now seek him out and do unto him or do something to him to repay for the injustice that he did to me. But the blood of Christ spoke something quite different, didn't it? The blood of Christ uh, cried out mercy. It cried out forgiveness. It cried out grace. So when we think about this idea of vengeance tonight, again, place yourself in the crosshairs. Think about how people might have wronged you and think about your response to them and how you have responded to them as you walk through life. Matthew, the fifth chapter, is the next place that we're going to look. You know, that new law that Christ brought, I think, was intended to show man how justice could be replaced with mercy. And when we read from the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5, Jesus makes everything very plain and clear, uh, clear to understand, easy to understand, but not easy to follow. Matthew 5, beginning of verse 43, the Bible says this, 
You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. The quest for perfection is a long and intense pursuit and we don't think, I, think, I don't think we ever attain it. We don't attend perfection. But it's a pursuit. We chase it. And this is an area I know I need work, and I, I gather may, maybe some of us here do too. <laughs> it's not a work that anybody's excited to do, doing good to those who have done us wrong or done us bad. But then again, neither is wearing the name of Christ. It's not an easy thing to do all the time. We choose today how we live, though, and who we're going to live for. And in this category of life, if we want to live for Christ, we have to let vengeance be God's. When we consider the vengeance, or men of vengeance, from the scriptures, who comes to your minds? I think about this, and as I was putting this lesson together, there were a couple of names that jumped right into my brain, right into my head, and the first one I want to talk about tonight is Samson. You know, Samson was a vengeful person. You look at all of his stories, or you think about all his stories, and the first account begins with an Israelite who fell in love with a Philistine. That's Samson. He fell in love with this woman. She was not of his nation. And when he did fall in love with her, their parents were very concerned about this. They urged and pled with Samson to go ahead and find somebody of their own people. Find somebody who believed in God. Find somebody who was like them. But he was going to pursue her, and Samson didn't know it at the time, but that might have been from God. Judges 14, Samson would petition his parents about this lovely Philistine woman. He thought was lovely anyways. And he pled with them uh, to go ahead and support that. But they pled with him, you need to find somebody of your own people. Verse 4 again tells us that desire was of God. And I'm not sure exactly what to make of that. That's not our subject tonight. We won't talk about it. But he ended up marrying her. And after marrying her, they came to this marriage feast, and Samson decided he was going to pose a riddle to the Philistine people. And he, he poses this riddle, and he, uh, he, as he was going along his way, he had come across a lion, and uh, a, a nest of bees was uh, burrowed into the innards of this lion somehow. And he, is, uh, he had seen that, and he decided, well, this is the riddle that I'm going to present. He goes back to the Philistines, and he tells them, uh, I, I don't remember the exact wording. Let me pull it up right quick. I don't want to misquote that. That's in Judges, the 14th chapter, if you want to follow along with me. He says, out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. And for three days, they couldn't explain the riddle. Well, the Philistines knew that you know, Samson was a gambling man. Before he told this riddle, he told them, if you guess my riddle, I'll give you 30 changes of clothes. But uh, if you can't guess my riddle, then you'll have to give me 30 changes of clothes. So they proceed for three days. Nothing amounts to anything. They can't figure it out. And they start to bother Samson's new wife, this Philistine girl. They start to bug her and tell her, Oh, I see what you've done. You brought all of our brethren out here to this Israelite's wedding with you so that you can just take advantage of us. They start laying guilt on her. And when guilt didn't work, they turned to threats. They said, well, we're going to burn your father, you and your father's house if you don't tell us. Well, that new wife pled and pled with Samson to give her the answer because Samson hadn't even told his new wife. But they, he, she begged and begged Samson to let her know the answer so that you know she could at least know. <laughs> Samson was, uh, I guess, a little wise in that he didn't tell her right off, but he gave in finally. After seven days, the bet was that seven days later, if by sundown, if they couldn't figure it out, they would, they would pay up. Well, on the seventh day, Samson finally caved in. He told his new wife exactly the answer to the riddle, and the Philistines came and smugly, arrogantly, told Samson the answer. <laughs> Samson's response was, well, if you had to plow with my heifer, you never would have known. In other words, if, if you hadn't have taken something that was mine that belonged to me and used it for yourself, you never would have known. Samson was mad. <laughs> so what did he do? Well, he, he took revenge. He went out and he killed 30 Philistines, took their clothes, and delivered those clothes to those people. I, I, sometimes I wonder, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in some of these settings and just know exactly what happened. I don't know if these were the clothes that were on the dead bodies. I don't know if uh, he sought out their houses or if these things were covered in blood. I have no idea. But what I do know is he delivered on his bed 
He gave those 30 changes of clothes to the Philistines. Well, he was upset, he was angry, and he stormed off and he left his new bride behind because of what she had done and tattling on his riddle. But sometime later he came back to that same house and asked the father to give him his wife. The father said, well, when you left, I didn't know you were ever going to come back, so I gave her to your friend. Samson had a best man at the wedding. He said, I gave him to your best man. What an awful thing to do. And he was, there Samson, he was mad again. So what did he do? He decided to tie up some foxes together and somehow tie up some fire behind them and set those foxes free in their fields and they went and burned all the Philistine fields. <laughs> revenge. He took his revenge. We find later he went to, uh, went into a harlot at Gaza. He tore up their gates because they said, well, here he is. We've got him trapped now. And they, they tried to bar the gates. Well, Samson just pulled all that stuff off and destroyed it. Samson had a long-going battle with the Philistines. And at one point in time, Samson again fell for another woman. This time her name was Delilah. And we all know this story well, so I'm not going to tell it too much. Delilah was a seductress whose delight was in money. And the game ensued. Samson liked playing this little game with her. And I don't know what that looked like. I don't, want, I don't think I really want to know what that game looked like, but what eventually happened is Samson revealed something that was considered a source of his strength or whether that truly gave him strength or it was something that God just didn't want Sam, Samson to reveal. It doesn't matter. God took his strength when he revealed it. But this long saga with Samson and the Philistines ends in Judges 16. And if you want to read the story from Judges 14 to 16, it's a great story to read. Judges 16. Now I've lost Judges again. Judges 16, verse 23 through 30 says this. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, to rejoice. And they said, Our god has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. And when the people saw him, they praised their god, for they said, Our god has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. So it happened when their hearts were married that they said, Call for Samuel, or Samson, sorry, Samson that he may perform for us. So they called for Samson from the prison, and he performed for them, and they stationed him between the pillars. And Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, let me feel the pillars which support the temple so I can lean on them. The temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof, watching while Samson performed. And Samson called the Lord, saying, Oh, Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once. Oh, God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. They had pulled out, put out his eyes, by the way. Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple. He braced himself against them, one on his right, the other on his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might. And the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. And his brothers and his father and his father's household came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zora and Eshtel in the tomb of his father, Manoah. He judged Israel for 20 years. Samson is one that definitely comes to mind when we think about this idea of vengeance, when we think about the idea of revenge. Another person that kind of sprung to my head was uh, that of David. You know, David, we don't, I don't think we think of him as a vengeful character very often, but there was one point in time where David was ready to, to pay a man back for the evil and for the wickedness that was done to him. In, Samuel, in 1 Samuel, the 25th chapter, starting in verse 2, the Bible says this, There was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel, and the man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. And the name of the man was Nabal, and his, the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a beautiful woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. But the man was harsh and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. When David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, David sent ten young men. And David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, Peace be to you, peace to your house, and peace to all that you have. Now I have heard that you have ship, uh, shearers, your shepherds were with us, and we did not hurt them, nor was there anything missing from them all the while they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they'll tell you. Therefore let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son David. So when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all these words in the name of David and waited. And then Nabal answered, verse 10, 
He answered David's servants and said, Who's David? And who's the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away each one from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I've killed for my shears and give it to men when I do not know where they are from? Now, folks, this was a large insult. On a feast day in Israel, it was common for people to make an ask like, like David did. And I know in our culture and our times, that might seem like an odd thing to do, to ask to come and to, have, to be provided for, to be cared for. But in Israel, this was very common. And it was an insult, not just to deny David and his men the, the spoil of kind of protecting those shepherds, but it was an insult in the way that he answered, too, because he knew King Saul. He knew what had happened between David and King Saul. Nabal knew those things, and that's exactly why he answered the way he did. He was being arrogant again, and he was being rude. Well, I'm going to make this longer story a little shorter, if not for the swift, swift action of a very brave woman and the wife of Nabal, a woman by the name of Abigail. Many, many people would have been killed that day. David had a spirit that sometimes was vengeful too. He wanted to go out and take care of this guy because he had done him wrong. He had shamed him. There's one more instance that comes to my mind that we're going to talk about tonight. And this is from the New Testament. If you, again, if you have your Bibles and want to turn and read with me, we're going to read from John the 18th chapter. And this is in the garden just before Jesus goes to the cross, just before he's arrested. You remember that he had gone to the Garden of Gethsemane to weep and to pray with his disciples. In John 18, beginning in verse 3, the Bible says this. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Who are you seeking? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Who are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I've told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. Speaking of his disciples. Verse 9 says, That the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke of those whom you gave me. I have lost none. Verse 10 tells us, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put up your sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? There's uh, more to that story in Matthew 26, too, that we're going to skip for time's sake tonight. You know, Jesus taught Peter a lesson that day that's an important lesson for all of us to understand and to know. His kingdom is not going to be delivered to men with a show of force or with any show of violence. It was a kingdom that was going to be brought about in a peaceful way. And I want us to consider a few things as we think about Jesus' rebuke of Peter tonight. Jesus knew people's hearts. He knew what people were thinking. He knew what they were going to do. Matthew 9 and 4 tells us Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? Jesus had that ability. He had that power to look at a person and to know what they were thinking. Matthew 22, verse 18, Jesus perceived the wickedness in the people that were persecuting him. Was Jesus blind to the games that were being played? I mean, he told them, you've come out to me with pitchforks and uh, with torches. I I've been in your synagogues all the time, and you're coming out here in the middle of the night to do this? Jesus knew. But Jesus' attitude and his speech, they, they didn't betray him. And they showed us a wonderful and a perfect example of how we ought to act when people persecute us without any cause. Luke, the 23rd chapter, verse 34, as Jesus hung on the cross, do you remember the words that he uttered? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Matthew 26 Verse 47 through 52, uh, if we were to read that whole account, we would come to a, a portion of uh, the passage where Judas approaches him and he tells Judas, friend, friend, why have you come? <laughs> Jesus called Judas his friend. He knew his heart, he knew his mind, he knew he was there to betray him. And he said, friend, why are you here? It's not that Jesus didn't even know, he knew. Matthew 23, verse 37 when he's speaking to the Pharisees, to those who were trying to persecute him, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets, how often I would, have, I would like to have gathered your children as, hen, as a hen gathers her chicks unto herself. This was the mind, this was the spirit and the attitude of Christ. The New Testament law 
outside of the example of Christ, the New Testament law preaches the same thing and it teaches the same thing. We can go back again to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew the 6th chapter. It wasn't just chapter 5 that said these things. Matthew 6 verse 14 and 15 is the same idea. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That might be one of the scariest verses in all the scriptures right there. We talked about that today. I know we did, but that's one of my scariest verses in all the scriptures because sometimes I don't want to forgive somebody. I don't like what they did to me. Actually, usually it's not me. I don't like what they did to my kids. <laughs> and I want to hurt them. <laughs> I want to do something to get back at them. I want to get even with them. That's a spirit that I have to fight. And I, if you do too, I'm there with you. I understand. But as Christians, we aspire to be better than that. And we can do better than that. Jesus showed us we can do better than that. In Mark, the 11th chapter, you hear some of the same sentiment uttered in verses 25 and 26 where the Bible says, And whenever you stand praying, if, any, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. It's very plain, folks, and it's a scary, scary verse especially if we struggle in this area of life. 1 Peter, the second chapter, is the next place I'd like for us to look at in terms of New Testament law. 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, in verse 21 through 23, the Bible says this, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his uh, mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return when he, was, when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. We call ourselves Christians today, right? We are a Christian people. What does that mean? Well, it means to be a follower of Christ. We are following the example that he set. But when we claim to be his and we do not walk the walk, what are we? Are we, are we Christians? Can we say that we are Christians if we're not following the example that he set out for us? First John, chapter, chapter 2, and verse 3 through 11, the Bible gives us instructions on how we ought to walk and conduct ourselves amongst our brethren. The Bible says in 1 John, chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God has perfected him. By this we know that we are in him. Guys, this is a confidence boost for us as Christians, and this is what he's getting ready to dive into. It should help us. It should give us all the confidence in the world that we're doing the right thing. In a world that's full of religious confusion, there are very few things that we can kind of hang our hat on and say, okay, I think we've got this understood. And this is one of them, folks. When we understand... That walking in the light means following these things. We can know that we are in Him. And that's an impressive thing. It's an amazing thing. Verse 5 of that same passage says this. I'm sorry, verse 6. He who says he abides in Him and ought, uh, him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. This old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. But he who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. The Bible clearly emphasizes the need for love in a Christian's life, especially when it comes to the love of our brothers and sisters in Christ. This is how the Bible tells us we can know that we are in him by that demonstration of love, by walking in the light, following his commands, and expressing love to our brethren. Now, James 5 and 9 is the next passage we're going to look at. And I want us to pay very close attention to this, folks. This is a command from God, and it's no less a command than anything else that you hold uh, dear to your heart. But it's an important one that I think oftentimes we struggle with and we fail in all the time. James chapter 5, beginning in verse 9, actually only verse 9. The Bible says this, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. It's a command of God, and we need to take a step back and honestly make assessment of ourselves in this. Have we ever complained about our brethren? 
yeah, I know I have. I, I shouldn't, and I know I shouldn't, but I do, and I have, and when I do, I try to think I shouldn't have done that, and I try to do better. Don't think about your neighbor. Don't think about people who have talked about you. You think about yourself. Do not grumble against one another. How many of us read this and say, uh-oh, <laughs> I'm in the group. Well, when someone does something that needs forgiving, of course we can forgive them, but we're talking about brethren here, right? That's the only uh, love, that's the only attitude that we need to save this, this vengeful spirit towards, right? We, if people of the world harm us, well, we can be angry and evil and wicked to them, or we can try and get vengeance from them, but we, we've just talked about things with regard to our brethren. Uh, we were driving out towards the coast today, and uh, uh, Jared pulled forward in his car. <laughs> there was a guy that was coming the other way. He didn't like the move that Jared made, so he lifted up his arm out of the window. He kind of shook his fist a little bit. He was, he was angry. Well, it, would Jared have been doing right if he would have rolled down his window and gave him a fist too and said, all right, you want to fight? Well, you know, <laughs> we know that's not the right response that we're supposed to have as Christians, but I think sometimes we justify it by saying, well, these are people of the world, so we can treat them a little different than the people of the world, right? It's not what the Bible says. The Bible tells us in Romans, the 12th chapter, that we need to care for the needs even of our enemy. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 17 the Bible says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Not with our brethren, with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's a sweet verse right there. I love that verse. Overcoming evil with good. Sometimes I am very tempted when evil is done to me to return evil to them. But if I work to give them good, if I kill them with kindness as my wife so lovingly expresses so often, I'm doing what the Lord wants me to do. Whether that's a brother or whether that's somebody of the world. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 15 says, See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Always pursue what is good. Even with the Old Testament law, we had things just like this. <laughs> we had verses with these same exact sentiments. Uh, I know a lot of times we think of the Old Testament law as a law... Uh, that allowed for vengeance to be taken. But especially amongst brethren, the Israelites, they weren't to do that. God made that very clear. Leviticus, the 19th chapter, and verse 18 says this, You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Proverbs, the 24th chapter, expresses much the same, much the same thing. Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 29 says, do, do not say, I will do to him just as he has done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. You don't do that. Solomon's wisdom teaches that. So Christians, it's similar for us today. When our brethren mistreat us, what is the proper and the right response according uh, to what the scriptures teach? The apostle Paul teaches the Ephesians this exact lesson. Ephesians 4, starting in verse 31, the Bible says this, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Those are all the bad things that vengeance drudges up in our hearts. Listen to it again. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking. Let it be put away from you and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So what is to be our attitude towards our enemies, towards our neighbors, towards the children of God? These categories of people, what's our attitude when they lie to us, when they cheat us? when they steal from us, when they manipulate us, when they hurt us? Do we return good for the evil? Or do we normally just think, I don't want to see that person or hear that person or have anything to do with that person again? I, I'll tell you, a lot of times that's where my mind goes. I, I don't want to return good. It's not that I want to return evil, but I don't want to do nothing. I don't want to have nothing to do with the person. But that's not the spirit that Christ encourages us to have, is it? Look to the example of our Lord who endured all of what we endure 
and that much more. I mean, he pitied the people. People that acted against him, he felt sorry for them. He genuinely cared enough for them and was sorry that they were going the way that they were going. And we can do that too. We just have to care enough about the people. Sometimes that's the problem. Sometimes that's our issue is we don't care about those people as much as we should, the way that we should. You know, this is a major key, I think, to unraveling a major issue that's for us. It's simple to understand, but it's just difficult to obey. We are to love. We're to love one another. 1 John, the third chapter, verse 16 through 23, talks about this in depth and detail. It says this, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's good and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we're of the truth. And shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, our heart does not condemn us. We have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. It's hard to love, though, isn't it? Especially when people are mistreating us. But in the end... Regardless of our attitude or our actions, one thing we can be assured of, when people do mistreat us, God is going to punish that. He is going to have vengeance for the sake of justice, not because you were wrong, but because justice demanded that something be done. His, the judgment is his to take, though. It's his place to inflict the punishment. It's not ours. We don't pass judgment over whether or not someone's bound for heaven or hell. We don't we look to the Bible and we encourage people to live its truths, but we don't get to decide their fate, do we? Nor do we get to inflict the punishment for their bad deeds. They might deserve to be punished for their sins, but we await God's judgment. We anticipate the upholding of his justice, of course, tempered with mercy. Oh, how thankful that we can be for that mercy that sometimes gets extended to our enemies, but if it weren't extended to our enemies, it wouldn't be extended to us either. <laughs> we want that. We want God to extend his mercy because we know that we've done things that deserve much worse than mercy. Romans 3.23 tells us all of sin to fall short of glory of God. We're all in trouble. But thank God we do have an advocate, a sacrifice and a helper in our deepest hour of need. Somebody, Romans 5 tells us, who can have compassion, who can... Uh, uh, who can who has gone through some of the things that we go through here in this life. Jesus went through the human life. He understands the things that we endure in life. He understands uh, our needs, you know, the, the things that we want when somebody wrongs us. He understands that. Understanding the fate of all men can help us too. Understanding that the people who do wrong us, they are bound for an eternal fate and a God who is just, who will strike his own form of vengeance on these people regardless of anything that we do. Romans 12, 19 tells us vengeance is mine. God has, is the owner of the vengeance. He is the one who can take the vengeance. <laughs> Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, we are introduced to a scene that I'm not going to comment on very much because Brother Delmer has probably changed my mind about some of these things, so I'm going to skip some. <laughs> but Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 says this, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. There are many people who have suffered in this life, and it sometimes feels like a very, very long waiting game to have to wait for that justice to be repaid. But you know, if we're thinking the way that Christians should think, we shouldn't even want God to take vengeance on them anyways. We should pray for them to do better. We should pray for them to fix their lives and to, uh, you know, to make their wrongs righted so that they can enjoy heaven with us too. And until we get there, we're always going to have a problem with taking our own vengeance and doing, a thing, doing things our own way. 
2 Thessalonians is another place that talks about this idea of how long-suffering we are to be. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 says this. Did I say that right? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of God. Of his power. Isn't that a, it's a sad thing to see that. It's a, it's a scary thing to see that, but it's a sad thing to see that, to know that there will be pun people punished. Those who don't know God, those who choose a path other than God, those who don't obey the gospel. It's sad. And we don't want to be counted in that number that God desires to take vengeance upon, do we? Well, then we have to work on this area of life because I think a lot of us struggle with it. We should, should we strive to be our very best for God when he says something in his word? We should just, we should do everything we can to run towards that, especially in an area where we know we struggle. The passage we, that we read in 1 John chapter 2 tells us we can know that we are His by the love that we have for one another. What kind of love is shown to men when we don't strive to love them like Christ loved us when He hung on that cross and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I want to close with one final example. This is a parable that Jesus told that I think perfectly paints the picture uh, to help us understand and to remember how we need to act when people do us wrong. Matthew 18, beginning in verse 21, the Bible says this, Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Peter was acting like that was a lot. <laughs> well, any of us who've been married know that we probably wronged our wives more than seven and uh, have we felt wronged more than seven, whether they have or not, I guess, depending on each marriage. <laughs> But, I mean, we can do it with our spouses most of the time, right? We should be able to. That's the person we put by our side. Up to seven times, he says. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to sell accounts with his servants. And when he began to sell accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay his master command that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down with him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, listen to the words, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. But he would not. But he went and threw him in prison until he should pay off the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. And then his master, after he called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. Verse 35, again, one of the scariest verses in the scriptures. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Listen well to the advisement to beware of the punishment of an unforgiving spirit. If you've got that problem today, You've got to get it fixed. Because if we can't forgive our brethren, we better not expect to be forgiven in the day of judgment. The Bible tells in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, Be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. We want God's blessing, right? We don't want his wrath. If we want it, then we've got to do the things that we're being encouraged to tonight. We need to know the rules of the New Testament kingdom. If someone does good to you, do good to them. If someone does evil to you, do good to them. If someone gives you something good, do good to them. If someone steals from you, do good to them. If someone praises you, do good to them. If somebody humiliates you, do good to them. If someone binds your wounds, do good to them. If someone wounds you, do good to them. It's the same universally across the board. We do good to other people. That's what we do. God wants you to inherit a blessing greater than anything that vengeance can ever offer to satisfy our souls. 
We've just got to decide that we're going to do it. <coughs> do you believe tonight that Jesus is the Son of God? Would you be willing to confess that? Would you be willing to make a, a change in your life and decide, I'm going to live by the precepts in this book? If you are ready to do those things and you're a fit candidate, you're ready to be baptized. And if you've not been baptized, we want to encourage you to do that tonight because that, according to what our words spoke tonight, if we don't obey the gospel, <laughs> we're lost. Being baptized, that is obeying the gospel. You can look to Romans 6 and see uh, how baptism replicates that death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That good news, that gospel message is what we all have to replicate in order to be saved. And if you haven't done that tonight, wouldn't you do that? Would you like to do that? We would love to help you with that. Tonight, if you have taken those steps, but somehow you, once again, have gotten off that path and you need to get right, then we want to encourage you. We want to help. We want to pray with you and for you. So come forward if you may have either of those classes as we stand and as we sing.